Hello, I'm David Hargreaves. I'm a consultant hand, wrist and elbow surgeon. I treat common hand problems as well as the rare injuries that occur, affect professional sports people. The area of uh, treatment that is required requires people to be very precise with the diagnosis, uh, careful interpretation of scans, as well as the very intricate precise surgery that is associated with it. So what we're going to talk about today is a number of injuries that I see from uh, different water sports. I'm going to break our, uh, this up into two groups, those of uh, the sports that occur from going into the water and those that are more on the water. Going into the water can be quite a forceful activity. It's hardly surprising that even when you dive from just one metre, you're hitting the water at nearly 20 miles an hour. And the impact onto the water with the uh, surface tension of the water can be really very significant. So it's no surprising, not surprising that people like these guys diving from the 10 metre board actually almost universally have had bad experiences and hurt themselves whilst training or in competition. It's quite interesting how you become a diver. In our area where I do some of my NHS work, which is down in Southampton, the elite group of schools for the diving go round the schools and ask how high your parents are. It's all about the height. And if you're relatively short, they will choose you because it's only the relatively short sports people who can make that amount of rotations in that limited amount of time to be able to become one of these elite athletes. It also commonly occurs in the immature skeleton as they're growing. The repetitive trauma that occurs from hitting the water is not dissimilar to those gymnastic gymnasts who from a young age are learning to tumble and sustaining repetitive problems, which can therefore damage the physeal part of the bone. There are specific injuries that occur, and the things that I as an upper limb surgeon see particularly are when the thumb gets caught and gets pulled back and sustain a sudden disruption of the ligament. Classically, the ulnar collateral ligament is the most crucial. Because it's usually occurred as a single episode, one gets something similar to that that we expect in the skier, hence the skier's thumb. Those are very important, particularly if the joint opens up by a long way, more than 60 degrees in the very early phase. If it opens up by a lot, more than 60 degrees in the very early phase, the first week or so, one can get a, not just a complete tear, but a disruption where the ligaments don't go back to sit appropriately. And therefore, those patients, the ligaments cannot heal. That's what we call a stena lesion. And in that group, particularly, we need to think about immediate early surgery. So if that's the case, more than 60 degrees, make sure they get referred at an early stage. We will come back later to the more chronic problem. In the wrist, it's not uncommon. I've had an elite uh, uh, patient with a scaphoid fracture. And it's similar to sustaining a fracture or a scaphalunate ligament rupture that one can get just due to the high, sudden hyperextension that they get. In the elbow, the sudden forced flexion of the elbow as they're hitting the elbow the water makes the elbow bend, although they are trying to maintain a straight elbow to be able to improve their entry into the water. And they can sustain ruptures to the triceps. I've had a couple of these, which are otherwise very rare injuries. Otherwise occur in weightlifters, usually when it's going wrong. I find that uh, there are different groups. There are those who are just mucking about in a swimming pool and they can sustain anything. There are people jumping up and down, landing, people diving into water and hitting the bottom of the pool. All those sorts of things are not uncommon. There is also um, the uh, 
uh, injury where you're hitting a rope and your finger gets caught and pulled out. Now they're quite difficult because patients often, or a little finger, gets pulled out. And one needs to be aware of the possibility of a collateral ligament injury in that sort of scenario. And the way to look for that is, is not immediately obvious because the hand normally has a lot of movement with the fingers in extension. One needs to bend the fingers to 90 degrees and then the collateral ligaments are tight. At that point, there should not be any lateral or ulnar movement of the fingers. So that is how to look for radial collateral ligament injuries in the hand from whatever sport. But there is this new sport called underwater rugby, which is a much more, even more brutal sport than water polo, where they do this sort of thing, where the snorkel and mask, you go underwater and it's sort of three-dimensional water polo, which sounds absolutely outrageous. But as you note, this chap has got his fingers strapped up. That's because there is a specific injury that occurs in this specific sport. And this specific sport and this specific injury has made me rethink the whole cause of the hook of hamate fracture. Because these guys get hook of hamate fractures. We're going to come back to his fingers strapped in a moment. The hook of the hamate fracture most commonly occurs either because of a fall over the top of a handlebar, classically landing on your hand and the impact uh, that's associated with that. Many of us all associate it though with the golfers and swinging and what we some people think of as a stress injury, either from a handle of a golf club or of a tennis racket and presumed that it is due to the impact of the racket or the club against the hook of the hammock. But we've decided already that there is no fall, there is no handlebar or club to impact against the hook of hammock, and yet these guys get this injury. Why? The reason is because when we actually look at the clinical tests, other than localised tenderness directly over the hook of the hamate, which there's the pisiform, hook of hamate is just a little bit distal and a little bit radial. The other test other than localised tenderness is what we call the right test, where in ulnar deviation, slight flexion, you flex the little finger and the FDP pulls on that tendon, or it pulls on the hook of hamate as it pulls round. So you do that, and it's made me twig that actually a lot of hook of hamate fractures are actually occurring because of the pull from FDP. And I'm certain that that is actually what's happening in the golfers. The tennis racket is held most commonly with the little finger, which is the thing which holds the racket in the right place. And on impact, that's exactly what's happening. The same in the golfers. It is not because of the bang from the, the racket. It is actually holding the racket. And there you are. Look at that position that he's holding that ball in. It's exactly what we've described in the right test. So I think that's rather interesting. So thanks to Underwater Rugby, it has uh, brought forward an understanding of a, a misconception that we had before. Hook of hamate fractures, if you do get them, can be treated most commonly non-operatively. Um, immobilisation. Most commonly people put them in splints, but actually, now that we begin to actually understand a bit more of the pathology and suddenly are beginning to twig this might be due to FDP, actually what we need to do is to stop them from bending their little fingers. So actually maybe taking them and immobilising them in radial deviation and maybe strapping their fingers up or immobilising their fingers with it straight in radial deviation may improve the outcome of non-operative treatment. 
And then there's the sort of slightly more sexy answer, which is the idea of fixation, which is putting a little screw right down the middle of a very little bone. But actually, that's nonsense. That's bonkers, because actually that is the gold standard. The crushed finger is a common problem. Because the crushed fingertip, uh, the thing that you really need to be aware of is, as you can see, the nail popping back out. It's very rare to be as dramatic and as yucky as that, so I do apologise. And But it's not uncommon that a little bit of the nail is sticking out, and if that's the case, they do badly. You need to make sure that's reduced. So if you see what you think may be a bit of the nail, make sure it's referred to be put back in. Again, on boats, there's quite a high instance of falls, which classically will lead to the outstretched hand. Sometimes even in some of these big, uh, in the Southern Oceans, uh, I've had professional sailors who, holding on to uh, things as they were falling, rupture their biceps, tendons, uh, and so there are injuries such as that that can occur. The other group, which was alluded to earlier, which I see, is very similar to the types of injuries that you get from horse riders where their fingers are wrapped, where the rein is wrapped around the fingers, the horse suddenly pulls and you, you get a sudden um, ulnar deviation of a finger or an avulsion. Avulsions, total avulsions like ring avulsions, you've got to be so careful. There are a number of these injuries which occur in ladies with rings on. The most important thing is to get the ring off immediately. There's, in the canoeing world, I've seen a number of patients who have had, again, a very rare injury that you don't normally see. And that was that they were getting pain in and around the ulnar collateral ligament. They denied any injury but it was stopping them from paddling and being able to perform their activities as well. And it was interesting because I looked into the history and I said, well, what particular bit of your canoeing is a real problem? And both these patients said, well, actually, it's backpedalling and trying to reverse the boat or to turn the canoe. And then when you actually think about what they're doing, it starts to become increasingly understandable what their injury is because as they're pushing there there is significant force from the paddle and both these patients had some instability and pain on stressing the ulnar collateral ligament now they do not have what we were talking about before which was a skier's thumb these guys have developed what we all originally learned as gamekeeper's thumb and gamekeeper's thumb is a slow stretching of the ligament compared to the skier's thumb, which is an acute rupture. In the chronic slow stretch, you can treat these very well non-operatively by just taking, avoiding the activity, a splint, like a thermoplastic splint maintaining a good posture, and rest and it will settle back down and heal again. It does need three to four months before they go back. Or when they go back to their canoeing, they need to have some support, strapping or a splint of some form to protect it. The other group where there is a very specific injury that occurs from rowing, that occurs from the sport, is rowing. There is a ridiculous rowing race that occurs every other year where people row across the Atlantic for fun. 50% of people who finish that race end up with the same symptoms in their forearm, which is, as many of you may guess, is what's called the intersection syndrome. The intersection syndrome is what many people would have thought was a de Quervain tenosynovitis, i.e. tenosynovitis, of course, of the first dorsal compartment. But it occurs very slightly more proximally. What happens is that they get the rubbing 
of the thumb extensors running over the wrist extensors. And that causes an inflammation at this site, which can be treated, again, non-operatively, with rest, splint, avoiding the activity, ice in the early phase, and many and often that will settle down. If it doesn't settle down, then sometimes a steroid injection and very rarely surgical intervention with a release of the uh, fascial bands between those two uh, uh, muscles at that site usually cures it. It's quite interesting because, of course, in London, you'll see lots of people going to the gym and sustaining such an injury. So be aware, it's not so uncommon. Um, uh, other sports, I've just had uh, the number three badminton player in Britain who's just come to me with exactly this problem. Uh, interesting. So it does occur from other sports as well, uh, but very common in the rowers. There is another type which, uh, which you should be aware of, though, with this, which is a patient who sustains a sudden tearing sensation with sudden bruising at exactly this site. And it's quite interesting because in those patients, it usually cures this condition because there is often some fibrous tissue which is just tethering these two groups of muscles together. And what happens is in that tearing sensation is they've automatically torn it spontaneously in an injury uh, which may have occurred. Actually, it occurred, one person who I've seen was uh, um, uh, water skiing and fell when this suddenly happened. They thought something awful happened. Actually, they had been having some symptoms of intersection syndrome, but then never again after this episode. So it is quite interesting this, uh, that. From water skiing, there are other injuries that you can get, uh, particularly exertional compartment syndrome, chronic compartment syndrome in the hands, also classically occurs in the, uh, the uh, windsurfers, as well as the tennis players, uh, uh, semi-pro tennis players, who've, uh, who've upped the amount of tennis they're playing, uh, may develop such conditions. Being aware of the condition is half the battle. Also, another rare injury that uh, I've seen in uh, water skiers is when they fall and their arm goes into the rope and the rope gets wrapped around them and they can sustain biceps muscle injuries, which almost only occurs in water skiers and parachutists when a rope goes across it in a high force uh, injury. So actually taking a good history, being aware of the... Uh, uh, of what's going on, being aware of different conditions and being very precise about where the site of maximal pain and how to reproduce those is the crux of making the correct diagnosis. And that is the most important thing in hand surgery. Thank you. Thank you.